So why did you wait for being laid off twice to find and follow your love? So why did it take me uh, that many layoffs? Probably because I was a little bit of a chicken to go out on my own. It literally was a turning point in my career where I decided, what do I love to do? I love to present. How can I turn that into a business? If you're going to do something you love, generally speaking, all you need to do is figure out how can you make money doing what you love? And today I tell people, what's your most valuable asset in 20 years from now? It's going to be your network. A piece of advice with our listeners, how can they become better networker? Start simple, one person a week. I'm going to add 52 people to my network this year. It all goes down to be the most likable person. If you're likable, people will want to be around you and they will listen more closely to you. Everything starts with a thought. You know that? Find your why first. Knowing your purpose and living your purpose are two separate things. My experience is people find it extremely difficult to live their purpose. Oh, yes. What do you think? The best part of knowing your purpose is that every decision you make in life can be funneled through your purpose. Hey, welcome, Nathan. So finally, the day is here when yes. I get to interview you. Thank you. Such a pleasure having you here, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, Nathan, let's take a dive. And that's one of my favorite questions. If you, you can take me to your childhood, and if you can recall one such episode from your life that brings a smile on your face today as well. Sure. Probably the first thing that comes to my mind is watching my mom leave the house while dinner was in the oven. And for half an hour, she would go down the street to a woman's house who had a, a skin disease that was tightening her skin. And she would go in and massage her legs and arms selflessly, no pay, just to help her feel better. And so I would walk with her down to that house. I'd wait outside for her, and then we'd walk back together. And I always felt like that was one of the most amazing lessons to see how giving can help other people without expecting anything in return. And I'm sure she got a thank you from the woman. But when we walked back together, we kind of walked back in silence. But it was fun to be with my mom and learn a lesson like that at about nine, eight, nine years old. And no doubt, I think that's where it, the generosity that you carry in your heart, I think that's where it comes from. I couldn't agree more with you on that one, definitely. I learned all about how to be a good person by watching how my mom treated other people, not just us as kids, but how she treated other people. And Nathan, how does that show up in your day-to-day -day life when you deal with your clients, when you deal with your partners, mm. when you deal with your stakeholders? It shows up by making it easier for me to get rapport with people mm -hmm. quickly, build trust even faster, and then get them to open up their minds and be a little bit curious about whatever we're there to talk about. So I have a, a pretty fun skill set of getting people into a curious state of mind because the minute you get people into a curious state of mind, they're, they're attached, they're connected, they want to know more. And it's just a trick in presentations that if you can get your audience either curious or laughing, you've got them. <laughs> Those are the, the two basic ways, right? Curious or laughing? Curious or laughing hmm. or smiling or chuckling. Any humor generally gets us feeling something. Curiosity also gets us feeling something because we're, we're curious, we want to know more. And so I've spent my entire career working on how to do that with people every possible chance I can get hmm. as fast as possible. Hmm. And in addition to that, I always try to provide value. Hmm. I, don't, I don't talk just to talk. I mean, people will ask me a question. I'll answer a question. I'll tell a story just for the sake of telling a story. But I, I generally, when in business, of course, when I'm dealing with somebody, even on a discovery call where I'm not charging them, but they're interviewing me and I'm interviewing them to see if they want to hire me, 
if I can do a keynote for them, I'm always looking to provide at least one bit of value. Mm. And it could come from anything like, um, for example, have you ever heard of Slido? No. So in your case, I can provide value right now by telling you, if you had a thousand people online with us right now, hmm. and all of a sudden you wanted to have them be able to ask questions and upvote the questions that have already been asked, you can't do that in Zoom very easily. Hmm. But you could do that in Slido at the snap of a finger. I could have you scan this QR code right now with your smartphone. Try it. And you'll see that it takes you right to Slido. And then you can ask me a question hmm. or anybody online can ask me a question without actually downloading an application. Wow. Or I could do this. I could turn on a poll hmm. and ask you, where are you located today? And you scan that QR code or you just put in slido.com and in this case, xmonks, answer hmm. the question. And then all of a sudden you start seeing where everybody's from. It's that easy to engage with an audience and get them to be able to ask you questions. And it's just an example. Yeah. Well, yeah, even yeah. if people don't hire me, I ask them, so how are we going to take questions from your audience? Hmm. And they say, oh, we'll use the chat window. I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> with 500 people, you're going to do a chat. Oh, yeah, we have two or three people that manage the chat window and we'll feed the questions to you. I said, no, I'm sorry. I can't work like that. That's the, how do you even do that? So I show them Slido. <laughs> Right on the spot. I say, here's how I do it. And they go, wow, we haven't wow. seen anything like yeah. that before. Yeah. And all, that's what I mean by always trying to provide value without punching people in the face. Mm. You know how yeah. some people always want to provide value by punching you in the face mm. and giving you information and, and coaching that maybe you don't even want <laughs> or lessons that who, who the hell are you to give me that kind of blah, blah, blah. And like, we don't even have rapport yet. Right. So. Mm. What I'm picking up right now is that how best I can actually add value to the person that I'm talking to, even if it's a discovery conversation. So Nathan, you work with individuals to prepare them for investor pitches, customer pitches, TED yes. talks, job interviews, yes. and it's a very mm -hmm. niche work that you're involved in, right? Mm. You're not just another communication or a presentation coach. No. So mm. when did you realize that you really enjoy working with people and specifically when they are pitching in for to their investors or when they're mm. pitching into their customers, TED Talks, job interviews. Throughout my career, I've worked on all my platform skills and presentation skills because I work for hardware and software companies doing the demos of their products and services. And the salespeople always liked me presenting because I had tremendous uh, trust in an audience because I'm the demo guy, I'm not the salespeople, right? So throughout my whole career, I really loved that whole interaction with an audience of one or many. And so that's where it all kind of started to become something I loved to do. And then at age 50, 13 years ago, I got laid off for the third time in my career. And I decided, you know what? I'm never gonna let that happen to me again. So I have two choices at that moment. I could retire, early retirement, which was uh, on the table. Actually, it was on the table, early retirement, or do something I love to do as an independent, as a solopreneur. Mm, mm, mm. So I just decided, what do I love to do? I love to present. How can I turn love of presentations into a money-making business? So I just hung my shield out. One day, I'm a coach. Literally, that's what I did. And I started contacting people I know and asking them if they needed any presentation skills coaching one-on-one. -on -one. Got a few people, got some war stories, got some successes, told those people how much I would charge if I was getting paid. But the exchange there was, I provide value to you. You let me tell the story of working with you so I can get more clients that will pay me. I got a bunch of those in the first year. And then I met my first entrepreneur who who was at the DLA Piper across the bay here. And they asked me if I could help them raise money. And so I worked with them. That kind of started the whole entrepreneur investor pitching because investor pitching is, it's just a, a variation of a standard communication persuasion kind of a presentation. And that's what I learned how to do best. So I think I roundabout answered the question, but 
it literally was a turning point in my career where I decided, what do I love to do? I love to present. How can I turn that into a business? So I just started doing it. And I don't have a degree in coaching. I don't have any certifications in coaching. And I don't necessarily recommend people have to get those things to become whatever they want to become. Mm-hmm. I had 35 years of presentations under my belt. Interesting. The question which is coming to me is like, why did you wait for being laid, laid off twice to find and follow your love? You know, while I'm asking you this question, it reminds me of a conversation that Oprah was having with Nelson Mandela. Yeah. And Oprah asked this question from Mr. Mandela. Mr. Mandela, uh, you have spent 27 years in the prison. And uh, what did you realize? How was it for you? And Nelson Mandela took a deep breath and he said, "Mm, 27 years. It took me 27 years, actually, if you ask me, Oprah. I think it gave me enough and more time to reflect. And Oprah asked, did you need 27 years for that? So why did you wait for being laid off twice to find Uh and follow your love? Partially it was family. I have family and children and the wife was home full time. So I was the breadwinner. And... Starting my own business was risky, as is is for anybody. With a family, I chose to continue working in corporate America because I was getting paid very well. And I was having a lot of fun, very low stress, medical coverage, dental coverage, and all those nice things that go with working for a company. And I was having fun. So it wasn't like I was going to a job I hated every day, like some People go to jobs every day they hate that they don't want to be at. I wasn't in that situation. I was typically in a situation where I loved my job. It's sometimes hard to give all that up and go into the being a solopreneur or an entrepreneur. I, I was really going to be a solopreneur. I had no, no plans to become an entrepreneur and grow a business and hire people and do all of that stuff. That was not what I wanted to do. So why did it take me uh, that many layoffs? Probably because I was a little bit of a chicken to go out on my own with the risk in front of me of having two young children and a full-time mortgage, health insurance, and all that kind of good stuff. I would do it exactly the same way again. If I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing, honestly. Because I did actually become a solopreneur in in, in, uh, 1986, six years after I was at a company that was uh, selling mainframe computer graphics software. And they decided to stop training their customers, just give it up. So I thought, well, wait a minute now, I'm the best trainer at the company here. Why don't I just provide that, fill in that gap as long as I can. So for four years, I was on my own and the company knew it and they were happy that I was training their customers. But around 1989, 90, nobody was using mainframe computer graphics anymore. They were all using PCs and printers. <laughs> so I was not needed anymore. The, the kind of the training literally fell off a cliff. So I went back into corporate America and did what I do. So I had experienced the solopreneur love of waking up every morning, being your own boss. So I was 29 years old when I first ran my own solopreneur business. It lasted four years. I loved every minute of it, except of course, things like, where is my next piece of business gonna come from? Man, it's so quiet, what's happening? And then all of a sudden, boom, (laughs) something would happen. Uh, But I would do it exactly the same way all over again, because part of what business did for me, as opposed to being an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, by being in corporates and traveling internationally Hmm. for every single company I ever worked for, my network, blew up in such good ways. And today I tell people, what's your most valuable asset in 20 years from now? It's going to be your network. And so all the corporates that I work for, I had this unfair advantage of traveling the world and building my network and meeting people face to face and Hmm. traveling business class and first class at some of these companies, because that's how they treated their employees. And I loved it. I was having a great time. And so I built my network and that's what I would recommend to all your listeners and viewers is no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, always be building your network and nurturing your network so that in 10, 20, 30 years from now, when you look back at what is your most valuable asset in business and 
in some cases in your personal life is your network. Mm, yeah. So I would love to dig deeper into this path. I know I'm going to take a lot of learning from mm. the presentation coach that you are and the niche that you hold so closely. Let's get into and get, get to know the networking coach that I'm talking mm. to Nathan right now. So you said the most important asset that you have in the years to come is how to build your network and how to nurture your network. If you were to share a piece of advice with our listeners, how can they become better networker? And above all, what's more important is how you nurture your network. Sure. Well, let's start with the first part, which is how to build your network. First thing is set a goal. Start simple. One person a week. I'm going to add 52 people to my network this year. Once a week, I'm going to reach out to somebody I know on my, let's say, LinkedIn. And I'm going to say, Gaurav, listen, I would like to meet one or two people like you. Can you connect me to one or two of the people you know? Because here's why. I'm trying to expand my network into India. And I don't know that many people there yet, except for you and two other people. Would you be willing to just connect me to maybe just one of your friends for the simple reason that I would like to network? and see if we can build a little bit of a relationship so that either, either I can provide some value to them right on the spot or perhaps in the future sometime, or maybe they one day will be able to provide me with value, blah, blah, blah. One a week, 52 people later, all of a sudden now you're building your network with a goal of doing one a week or two a week or five a week, whatever number you want. The number of people you have in your network is not as important as the quality of those people, obviously. And what I mean by quality is people that know who you are that might either respond to a post of yours or, ref or comment on a post of yours or share a post of yours without you having to ask. So set a goal. Otherwise, how do you build? You're not, or you need something to measure yourself by. So you look at the number you have today. If it's 250 and you want to increase it by 20%, one a week, easy peasy. Go to events, meet people at events, choose your networking opportunities or the people you want to network with, and then ask, is it okay if we connect on LinkedIn or whatever your method of connection is? Connect on LinkedIn, that's my favorite. I still think today LinkedIn is probably the most widely used business tool for networking. Go to events, they don't have to even be networking events. Just go to things like improv, like we talked about a moment ago, and you're in a class with 22 people, and now you have 21 opportunities to network, right? Now, you don't have to ask everybody to come into your network, but you just invite those in, or you ask to be invited into other people's network. One key, key tip is never ask for a connection over LinkedIn without sending a personal message with it. You know how people get recommended to connect with all these people and they go, connect, 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 connect. That's no way to build a connection. On the other side, how do you nurture a network? That's a very important question. Yes, yes. Well, nurturing a network, you can't, you can't contact three or 400 people every month personally. It's, it's not feasible, right? Yeah. So how do you nurture? I'll tell you how I nurture my network. And then remember, I'm a solopreneur. I am looking to build my business, but I'm also looking to provide value in my posts mm. or in my ability to connect or nurture my network. I don't always offer them something to buy. In fact, I hardly ever offer them something to buy. I don't try to sell them on anything. Mm. I try to continually provide value to them. Mm. So once a month, I will post on my LinkedIn profile mm. something that I feel provides value to my network. Or the best way to nurture your network, in my opinion, is when someone else writes something about you. Mm. And that's what comes from providing value, is when someone else, without you having to ask, mm. posts something about their interaction with you or something they learned from you, and then all of a sudden, mm. boom, 
all of these new people want to be part of your network because of what you provided value for someone else. I can give you a really good example of that that just recently happened if you want one. 10 years ago, I was working with a company in Ireland and we had a really good working relationship. They won awards, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Never heard from them again, which is pretty typical. I mean, I see their news, but they didn't need me anymore, right? They either raised their money, or they got to a level where they were proficient and they just did what they had to do and they ran their businesses, right? 10 years later, I get a email or LinkedIn connection request from one of the three people I worked with there. Mm. And he says, dear Nathan, I don't know if you remember me, but I've got this new opportunity that I'm working on. I wonder if you could help me. Of course. And I remembered their name, but I didn't really remember a whole lot about them, but we connected. He said, can we set up a, a meeting? I sent him a link for a 20 minute discovery call, just like I send anybody. We hop on. Oh, Rob, I remember you. He said, Nathan, listen, I don't want to take up much of your time, but I have this, I have to be an MC next week. You know, I was hoping to get some help from you and coaching from you on that. Can we set some time up tomorrow? They said, well, sure, but why don't we just start right now? He says, you would? Yeah, sure. Why not? Let's just start right now. I'm not going to charge you for this. You're just asking me some questions. You're a friend. Hmm. Hour and a half later, he says, Nathan, listen. <laughs> I got to let you go because I could keep you on for another hour and a half. I've learned so much from you in this hour and a half. Now, I'm not bragging to you or the listeners that I provide an hour and a half of value, but the truth is I provide an hour and a half of value. And then what happened? Next thing I know, he posts something on LinkedIn that literally said, I just spent, you can find this online. I just spent over an hour with Nathan, he provided so much value. I am shocked. And he just wrote that honest, authentic, how he felt. Hmm. There were over 10,000 views of that LinkedIn post. Wow. wow. Over 5,000 in the first two days. The comments were things like, I agree. I've worked with Nathan and he's gold. I couldn't agree more. Oh, yes, I agree. Not only did he validate what I did for him pro bono, because I wasn't going to charge him anyway, but look what happened as a result. The, just the fallout in a good way of somebody saying something good about you because you provide value for them and they couldn't hold back. They had to give back. So I'm going to give back to Nathan, but just writing how what a great experience it was. That's the law of reciprocity in action. In you provide value, 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 either somebody's going to feel so guilty that they've got to do something for you, or you're going to just ignore them because they keep taking and they don't give anything back, mm. either to you or someone else. Yeah. You know, I can't agree more because I remember our first conversation, Nathan, and the yeah. first in introductory conversation that we had, and when we were preparing for this conversation, yeah. the kind of value that I got from that conversation <laughs> was enormous. And I remember I asked you this question. What are the three things that you have always believed in? And the mm. first thing that you mentioned was maximize the impact and the value that you create for your audience. The second thing that you mentioned is that you coach using love and not fear. Yes. Tell me more about that. I've always believed that the people that punch you around and kick you around to get you to do things, some people react and, and will do things. You know, some people like to be kicked in the ass to get motivated or inspired to do things. I'm not that kind of person. You try to kick me in the ass, I'm going to rebel. And so the way I feel like I can get people to take action on anything I'm asking them to do or think about is to treat them with love, treat them as a good friend, treat them as a brother or a sister, but ones that you really like being around. And it all goes down to be the most likable person. If you're likable, people will want to be around you and they will listen more closely to you. If you're an a-hole or you punch people in the face because they're not doing what you want them to do or they just blew up on the stage and you're ripping them a new you-know-what, how is that inspiring? It's not. To me, it's demotivating. There are people in the startup world, I won't name names, one very famous guy, and I won't name names. I went to their demo day once a number of years ago, and there were a lot of people in the public sitting in the room. One of his companies goes up on stage and gives a 
pretty good presentation. He gets up out of his chair, flies up onto the stage and starts ripping them a new, what the hell was that was the most stupid present. I was thinking like, really? This is how you talk to people in public? I can't imagine what he says behind closed doors. Now, I've talked to people who have been through that program. 99% of the people just, just ignore it. But the 1%, they live in fear every time they walk up in front of somebody like that. Do you want your people to live in fear of, what are they going to rip me this today? I would much rather people strive for excellence than avoid fear. And I, I, you know, Jason Kalkanis is an example of someone in the startup world that uses a lot of F-bombs. He doesn't care what you think, and he'll tell you what he thinks no matter who you are. That's not the person I was talking about, by the way, just a moment ago. That's not me. I mean, sure, I'll drop an F-bomb occasionally because I'm having fun or it just like slips. But I don't use fear because it's, I don't think most people will take action if you try to treat them that way. That's this been my experience. Is, this is really interesting. I think if I just reflect in my life, somehow I've been able to attract people who continue to feed in me the importance of kindness, the importance of mm -hmm. giving, the importance mm -hmm. of love. And mm -hmm. this episode is not different. So thank you so much for You're welcome. validating the importance of operating from love rather than operating from fear in life. I feel better at night and I hope that my clients feel better at night and the people that hear me feel better about what they're getting from me. What you just said really boils down to what some people call the law of attraction. Hmm. Those energies we put out, those thoughts we put out, everything starts with a thought. You know that? Absolutely. Everything, you were a thought at one time before your parents had you, right? You, hey, maybe we should have a baby. That's how you started. Pretty much, right? It, mm. So we have to be careful of what we think of mm. because the more we think about it, the more we concentrate on it, believe it or not, at 64 years old, I can tell you what you think often comes to be. Mm. That's what we manifest. You want to hear the most amazing story related to that? I would love to. Please go ahead. When I started traveling internationally at 23 years old, I was walking off the airplane once. And right in front of me was this gentleman and he's walking out into the gate area and two young blonde haired girls, probably three, four years old, rush up to dad. He grabs them both, puts them up in his arms. They were twins. And then he walked all the way out of the airport with them in his arms and his wife took the bags. That visual stunned me. And I thought, I would love to have twins one day. And I wasn't married, wasn't even dating at 23. <laughs> Just a thought. It was like, oh my God, I want that. So I get married. We have trouble having kids. We go to in vitro fertilization. We have triplets for three weeks. Then one of them decided to not appear. So. We have twin girls, blonde hair, 29 years old now. <laughs> wow. Now, you could say that is ridiculous, Nathan, but hey, there were no twins in either of our families. None. And my wife even today says, but she loves her twins, obviously, but she mm. pushes back all the time now and says, damn, it's because of you that we have twins. I say, yep, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you can do it with human beings, you can do it with just about anything else, I think. Now, whether you get it the when you want it, that's a very different story. Yeah. Because <laughs> things have to line up, right? The, the energies in the universe all have to line up to provide whatever it is you're looking to hmm. attract to yourself. It's like maybe it's too far away right now and it's still traveling towards you, right? And hmm. it's not there yet. But why it's not there is a waste of time. Hmm. So... Just keep giving. Karma also, I mean, obviously that Absolutely. has a lot to do with when you give and you're building good karma for yourself and for the future and for your next life. And mm. Karma it comes back to you immediately sometimes and sometimes not for years. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And sometimes not at all until your next life, right? Yeah. The space or time could be different. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Let, let me just tap into the presentation and the communication coach in you. You spoke about that you work with people who are going for investor pitches, customer yes. pitches, TED Talks, job interviews. What are the similarities and the differences that you have found while working with these different individuals? Mm. Similarities. Uh, most of the people I end up coaching have at least some set of mm. presentation skills already in place. And I come in and offer them kind of the executive director position where I will, you're the director, you're the producer, the scriptwriter, and the actor. And I come in and say, what about this? What about that? Have you thought of this? And I help them just get better and amplify what they're already doing. So most of the clients that come my way, they've already got something. They've got some set, some toolbox. And then all I have to do is show them how to use the tools that are in that toolbox a little bit better, or there's a tool in that toolbox they're not using. And I say, hey, pick that up. Let's see how that would work. And they go, oh, wow. And it's like, it was with them all the time. Mm. That's kind of, I'm either reminding people of stuff they already know, mm. or I'm making them aware of something that's always been there that they mm. just weren't aware of. And so I just help people with those tools to get more confident about using them and achieving the results that they want, whether it's a TED Talk, investor pitch, a sales call, customer call. The whole point to all of those types of talks, in my opinion, is you're trying to persuade your audience to take some action. It's not always the same action, of course, but some action. And so I come at it more from a persuasive angle rather than an information dump angle. Now you said, what is different hmm. about, among all those people? What's different? I, I'd probably say that they all want to do their best work on the stage, whether it's virtual or in person, hmm. but they all have different goals for why hmm. they want to do well on stage. And so what's different is I always ask people, not only who's your audience, but what's your goal for this presentation or this pitch? And everybody's goal is generally different. Mm. So that's probably the main difference is that I'm always focusing on helping them achieve their goal, whether it's to get a second meeting, to get a referral in the investor world, for example, mm. you're not going to raise your money after your first pitch, right? Yeah, That's ridiculous. So the goal should never be to raise money. The goal should be to get rapport or to get a second meeting, or to get them to just ask some questions. Maybe the goal is to just get them to tell you whether your pitch is resonating with them or not, hmm. right? And I often get asked by startupers, when should I pitch to an investor? Hmm. I say, well, anytime you can. Hmm. They look at me cross-eyed and say, what? What if I'm not raising money? <laughs> what are you, crazy? You can still meet investors and talk to them and get to know them when you're not raising money so that when you are in, in the need of raising money, you already have friends. Yeah. <laughs> so call up an investor or network to an investor. That's the way I would do it. Go through Garav or Nathan and say, hey, I'd like to meet so-and-so and you're connected on a first level. Would you connect me please? And I would say, sure. Why do you want to meet them? And then you say, because I I'm very early stage as an entrepreneur, and I would love to get their opinion on how I'm pitching my business. Mm. Okay, great. Mm. Now that person's going to provide some value for you, aren't they? Yeah, they're going to give you some feedback. What can you do for them? Mm. Just trying to figure out how you can provide value back to somebody that has done that for you. So my point is this, when you pitch to investors, never ask for money until you are really ready. And investors will take uh, short meetings with you, especially today in this virtual world we're all living in. It's so much easier to get five or 10 minutes of somebody's time because they do the back-to-back -back calls over Zoom or Teams. Mm -hmm. So networking your way to investors to get feedback on your presentation, on your value proposition, on your elevator pitch, on your business model, on your revenue model, on your competition talk. Mm -hmm. Just pick one piece of your presentation. Let's say... The most difficult question you get as an entrepreneur is how to handle your competition. Hmm. Okay. 
that's where I start. I always start, what's the most difficult question you get when you're pitching? Let's start there and make it easier on you. So you take that one question and you find three investors who'd be willing to take calls with you to just help you work out. And very often I come across people who have got no idea about what they would like to talk about. The only thing that they know is that they would like to present to an audience. Oh. How, how do you help people to come up with that idea? Yeah. Right? yeah. And articulate it and mm. say it in a way that lands really well with their audience. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to have something that you are passionate about or enthusiastic about mm. in order for you to be able to communicate that enthusiasm and passion to an audience in an authentic way. Otherwise, you're acting, right? And some people act really, they do a great job acting. But if you're going to do something you love, generally speaking, all you need to do is figure out how can you make money doing what you love? Because mm -hmm. you need to put food on the table. Yeah. You need to pay rent. You need to do all those things unless people are going to pay all of that for you or if you're wealthy, which most of us are not. So I would brainstorm with yourself and find your why first. So you've heard of Simon Sinek, of course, right? Yeah. And he yeah. always says, start with why. Well, in 2017, he came out with a book called Find Your Why. Hmm. And when you find your why, knowing what to do about it and what to do in, with it in your life in terms of your next career move or your next job or, or your being a solopreneur and an entrepreneur, will be much easier once you know why you do what you do. Why do you get up every morning and do what you do? When you know that, and it's not hard to figure out, it only takes a couple hours generally to figure it out because your why and my why and everybody else's why has been already determined. The person you are today didn't just come to be from the last five or 10 years, did it? No. I mean, you've added to it, but where did the core of Gaurav come from? Hmm. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, when you were impressionable and you were listening and absorbing and learning and wondering all about the world around you, that's when your why was put in place, but most people don't realize it. I told you that story about my mom at age eight, nine years old. That's why my why is today. My why is, by the way, was to help enough other people get out of their lives, get more out of their lives so that I could live a more fulfilled life. That was my why. Very selfish. So but, would, it, would it be a fair assumption to make that in order to identify my why, I need to trace back to my life and look at those episodes that gave me happiness, that brought that that brought out the best in me, that made me dance mm -hmm. in that moment. Exactly, exactly. And, the, and to get there, you can generally get pretty close to that on your own, but all you really need is somebody to ask you a number of questions, to tell some stories about your past, and then all of a sudden, over two or three, one or two hour sessions like that, there becomes this red thread starting to appear. And then you realize when you feel goosebumps on your arms, when that red thread pops up and is visual and you realize that's why I tend to be such a kind person to homeless people or dogs or cats or snakes or trees or whatever it is you're kind to, generally relates to something back in your younger years that, in, that impressed upon you this kindness. And it's been there all this time and it's just not been articulated. Mm. When you articulate your why, you'll know if it's, if it's right because you will feel goosebumps on your arms. You will feel the hair on the back of your neck stand up. So when that book came out, when I read the book, I thought, oh, my why changed, but I didn't realize it. And at 50 years old, I was pretty much living a very fulfilled life. And when I read that, that book, I thought, oh, boy, I've had a pretty selfish why all these years. But hey, I help other people. It's okay to be a little selfish.
But my why changed when I became a solopreneur. And it was to help other people get more out of their lives so we can all live a more fulfilled life. And that book helped me get that distinction with that mm, slight change to help all instead of just me. Now I get goosebumps to this day when I say it and when I feel it. And every one of the people listening and you, you can all discover your why. I was so excited about this book, Gaurav, when I first read it, that I set out to help other people find their why, just to see if it really worked for other people, because it worked for me, to help them find their why. And I followed the instructions in the book. I used the questions in the book. I listened really well. I kept getting them talking, talking, talking. Tell me more about that. Tell me more. And it happened six out of six times. And I would do it for you, too. If you would like, I'll help you find your why or articulate your why. I'm not the only one that can do it. Anybody can do it. You just don't want to do it yourself. It's hard to do it yourself. You know, while I was listening to you, I, was act- I could actually experience the lightness of a feather. Mm. It was so surreal. Mm. Nathan, help me understand. On one hand, I could experience the lightness of a feather. But mm. at the same time, my experience is people find it extremely difficult to live their purpose. Oh, yes. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Knowing your purpose and living your purpose are two separate things. <laughs> it all has to do with your circumstances and situation in life. I mean, if, if I knew my, my why was to, let's say I wanted to be a presentation skills coach and help people that way, and I knew... That was part of my why, to go out and help people be better at doing that. If I couldn't afford to do it, I might have to figure out another way to live my why or to live my purpose. We can't always just drop everything we have in front of us and go off and do that. Sometimes it's irresponsible. Sometimes it's not the best thing to do at that moment in time. And it's hard. That's a tough question. You know, it's generally, I can answer it one way for sure. So if you don't have enough resources available to you to keep your life going as you can accept, maybe you don't eat out four nights a week, maybe eat out one night a week so you can save that money and make it last longer so that you can develop your business or your purpose. See, Living your purpose is not something you decide and you just go do. I mean, you decide, okay, this is my purpose. And we uncover your purpose in life is this. Now you need time to experiment. No matter what age you are, this could happen at age 22 or 92. You need time to experiment and figure out how to bring your why to life. But the best part of knowing your purpose is that every decision you make in life can be funneled through your purpose. Hmm. Does this fit my purpose? Yes. Embrace it. Does this fit my purpose? Not now. Sorry. I must say no to some things in life. Hmm. Hmm. It's a wonderful way to only be doing things that relate to that purpose. Of course, you may still need to exercise, which might not be related to your purpose. You may need still to take medication or go, you know, you still do things that maybe you don't want to do that aren't exactly related to your purpose, like eating, (laughs) bathing, stuff like that. Mm. But the most important thing is to take time to experiment and learn. How do you want to bring that why to life? Mm. Do you want to help other people? Do you just want to, I don't know, help animals? Do you want to, it takes experimentation and it's a fun fun experimenting because it's up to you you get Mm. to bring to life your why any which way you want to i chose to bring my why by helping people get better on stage Mm. here's the last question uh, nathan having gone through this beautiful journey that you've gone through yeah the lessons that you've learned in networking and uh, picking up a new job letting go of Mm. that finding a purpose for yourself experimenting with that having worked with so many entrepreneurs, startup founders, having worked with TEDx speakers, TED speakers, what do you know for sure with 100% certainty and surety? Ah, what do I know for sure? 
just one thing. <laughs> one thing is the person who speaks the least in the room tends to be the one who's the most has the most wisdom. And that much I know for sure. When you choose your words carefully, hmm. you tend to be the more respected person in the room, the person who I'm going to listen to that person. He doesn't talk, 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 just to talk, talk, talk. He's saying things that are meaningful and timely, thoughtful. That's one. I'll give you another. Yeah. I know for sure that the less you talk, the more likable you are. Meaning the better listener you become, your likability factor will go through the roof. If you just use these in the proportion that you were given them. Yeah. If you do more listening in life, you will find that people will instantly want to be around you more, especially if you show interest in what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Like you're doing right now, you're nodding your head. You're not just waiting for the next, for me to finish to ask me the next question. That kind of, yes, listen, yeah. listen, and listen more. Ask sure. that question, listen more. So I'm always looking to learn something I'll, I'll give you the third one, which is I know all of us can always learn something from everybody we meet mm. without them necessarily teaching us something. And so my goal when I meet people at a networking event is I don't leave them until they learn something from them. Mm. And I'll ask questions sometimes that will lead them to telling me something that I don't know yet. And uh, You're welcome. as I often share that, listen to the other person as if the other person is God universe or nature that's I think it, when it's coming from somebody like you it only validates my belief that i'm walking on the right path in the right direction that was an absolute pleasure talking to you nathan my pleasure happy to come back anytime thank you so much